uh, during the talk, just type them in the chat and every 10-ish, 15 minutes, I'll stop and answer them. Um, I think it's probably the best way to do that. So without further ado, let's talk about pruning. So um, I always like to start these sort of talks by asking a question. So um, why do we prune trees? Uh, is it just, you know, for the risk and the excitement, using power tools, um, large weights above our head, the danger, all that, all that stuff. It, it is, all joking aside, it's hard. It's physical work and it is dangerous. Um, and after all, uh, who prunes the trees in the forest? Uh, I mean, ultimately nobody, right? They pretty much uh, take care of themselves. It also turns out there are um, there are a number of negative effects that pruning can have on trees. So, and we're going to talk about those first before we get into how we successfully prune. Um, so, people, I think, are trying to say things. Hang on, let me make sure everything's working before I go on here. Hopefully everyone can hear me. Sounds like there may be individual problems, but the vast majority of people can hear me. Okay, so Cassie can help you guys. Cassie is my colleague, coworker. She can help you out in the chat if you're having problems, help you troubleshoot. Um, so with that said, we'll get back to the PowerPoint here and go on with the talk. So um, let's talk about what effects uh, pruning does have on woody plants. The, uh, the, the kind of silly cartoon here um, is actually kind of a real thing that happens. People oftentimes over prune trees. Um, pruning can have a lot of negative consequences. Um, negative consequences on trees. Uh, when, for example, when we prune, we're creating pathways for decay organisms to get into the tree. And that's what you can see here in this illustration. You can see these dark pockets are wood that's been affected by decay and it came in through the wounds. Um, decay makes wood weaker and makes a tree more likely to fail. So it's something we kind of want to avoid. And extrapolating, we want to prune in a way that minimizes the chance of decay getting into the tree. Here's a picture of a crab apple actually at my house of a branch that failed. And you can see this whole center section was affected by decay. And the way trees deal with decay is they try to build walls around it and then abandon the affected tissue. And the black line here around the edge is the wall the tree um, has tried to construct to contain decay. Of course, it made the limb weak and the limb ended up breaking anyways. Um, decay or uh, pruning also is just uh, stressful for a tree in general. It reduces the tree's vigor. It reduces the amount of energy it has to do work. Um, you take off leaves, there's less leaves to do photosynthesis to create energy for the tree. Trees also store energy. They store starches in their living wood not just in their roots, but also in their branches. And so when we remove a branch, we're removing stored energy that the tree had banked away for later, which is you know, pretty stressful, pretty annoying if you're the tree. Um, and on top of that, the tree has to expend energy to fight decay and close wounds after we, pr after we prune. So all those things together just equal stress. Um, reduce the amount of energy a tree has. They all together do that. Improper pruning um, can uh, damage a tree's lung structure, can create poor structure. Um, on, the, on the left here, you can see good pruning that's done to encourage a strong central leader, small lateral branches, that's good pruning. Over here on the right, we have pruning that's bad. So we, I'll get rid of those little circles so you can see. And so we, we've tipped it, we've cut every branch, um, removed the terminal bud, which means the lateral buds are released to start growing. And so you get this really, um, you get this really, kind of witch's broom sort of habit if you improperly prune. So proper pruning is good, but improper pruning can lead to bad structure. And so that is a potential negative consequence of pruning is that you know, we cause damage because we do it improperly. All that said though, you know, the risk for decay, the lowered energy state, the, um, the potential for creating poor structural issues is kind of balanced by the potential we have to improve a tree by pruning. In fact, I would I'd go as far to say that all you know landscape trees generally need pruning. They don't benefit from it. They shouldn't sometimes have it. They really need it. Um, and a lot of it has to do with the difference between a landscape and a forest. In a forest setting, all the trees grow close together. There's a lot of competition from light um, for, for a given tree based on the amount of neighbors it has. 
And so trees have a lot of incentive to grow straight, tall, one trunk, um, like you can see here in this picture of a stereotypical forest on the left. Uh, that's not at all like a landscape. Most landscapes, there's not a lot of competition. Sorry, this is just going photomatically. There's not a lot of competition for light. Um, and so instead of growing um, a trees on its own or has very few things around it, so instead of growing straight and tall with a single trunk, the trees tend to be spreading like this cottonwood on the right-hand picture. They tend to have a lot of branches low on their canopy, a lot of, um, a lot of trunks competing to be the dominant trunk, and they tend to be more spreading. And it turns out trees evolved to support the forest forms, usually on the left, almost all trees evolved in a forest setting and have not really evolved to support, like and when I say support, literally physically support and keep upright the um, structure on the right that we oftentimes get in landscapes. So a lot of our pruning of landscape trees involves taking that tr the landscape tree on the, on the right and making it look more like a forest tree on the left. And we'll talk about how we go Go about doing that here as we go on. And so on the whole, the um, positives of improving the tree's health, uh, improving its structure, um, removing limbs in a controlled manner so they don't just break in storms and things like that is outweighs, if done correctly, the negatives of creating pathways for decay and reducing the vigor of the tree, if it's done correctly. However, if you prune incorrectly, you can shift the balance over and make it uh, make pruning more of a negative for a tree. So we're gonna go through real quick here, the best practices for making pruning cuts. And then we'll talk about how we apply those pruning cuts in like an organized plan to, um, to a tree. So when you're pruning a tree, there's a couple things that you always wanna keep in mind. And the first is that the smaller the pruning cuts you're making in diameter, and the diameter of the branch is being removed, the better. Um, that's because for a couple of reasons, but one major reason that's true is that as a branch gets, as, a, as any given branch of a tree or trunk gets older, um, what starts to happen is it starts taking living wood and transitioning it from what we call sapwood, which is living, to heartwood, which is dead wood. Um, heartwood is a two by four in place. It's just standing there for support, but the tree has otherwise abandoned it and it is no longer living. It doesn't move water for the tree or anything like that. And so on the picture on the left, you can see the red colored wood in the center of that conifer, excuse me, is heartwood. Um, and the reason we care about that is that we do not want to be exposing heartwood with our pruning cuts because again, it is dead. It cannot actively fight decay. It only has whatever passive defenses against decay the tree gave it when it created it. A real common example of heartwood is like redwoods have heartwood that's very resistant to decay, right? So it's very, des very desirable. It's very desirable for, um, it's very desirable for um, building things, decks and patios and stuff like that. Cottonwoods do create heartwood, but they don't put a lot of energy into making it resistant to decay. And so there's a whole spectrum there. The cut on the left you can see is a small cut. All the wood is the same color. We have an exposed heartwood. Um, so that's a very safe cut. So our general rule of thumb is that we want to keep our cuts smaller than four inches, really two, but it's, you know, four is kind of more of a realistic, real world compromise. Um, so we don't expose heartwood um, when we remove a branch. There are three types, um, general types of pruning cuts. Um, and the first one I'm going to talk about is a removal cut. This is by far the safest pruning cut you can do. Our removal cut revolves, er, sorry, involves removing a small branch and leaving the larger branch at the union of two branches. So we're removing a small branch, leaving the larger branch. Remove the small branch, that's, that's how I remember it. Um, if the removal cut uh, is, if you take off a branch that has what we call a collar, uh, it is a very safe pruning cut with low risk of decay, especially when it's smaller. Um, so branch collars are the swollen area of tissue that occurs where branches meet. And it's, I'm kind of highlighting it here with my mouse and I'll show you another picture of it here coming up. Um, so the collar, so again, it's a swollen area of tissue. And here's a great picture from Dr. Gilman um, out of Florida's um, textbook that shows a collar. So a collar is where the, where the wood from the parent branch overlaps with the wood from the uh, lateral branch. So you can see the grain of wood um, from the parent branch breeding, uh, bleeding over onto the lateral branch. 
And underneath this, there's wood from the lateral branch bleeding over onto the parent branch. So it's like interlocking of wood and it makes that union strong. And within a collar, there's also um, this magical thing we call the branch uh, defense zone, which can uh, actively keep decay out of the wound, can actively fight decay. So if you're removing, um, if you're removing a small branch, which has a collar, that's very safe. Now the trick is collars only really form on branches, um, if, so I should say in unions where the lateral branch is half the size or less of the parent. If the branches are the same size or near the same size, collars do not form. It's an important thing to keep in mind as we talk about you know, our objectives when we're, when we're pruning. When executing a removal cut, um, if the branch is less than an inch, you just make the cut at the red dotted line in the picture here right outside that swollen collar. Right? If, on the other hand, the branch is larger than an inch, we want to get the weight of the branch off before we make that final cut um, just to reduce the risk of tearing. So in that case, we um, take our saw, our printing saw, and we come out um, three-ish or so inches from the, um, the collar. We make an undercut till our saw starts binding. That would be cut one. When our saw starts binding, we take it out and go on top and make an overcut. The weight of the, this creates a hinge, which the weight of the branch breaks. And so now this part of the branch is off and uh, we can come in and make our final cut now that the weight's gone. Alternately, um, you can make the overcut a few inches down the branch. That's the way I was taught. So kind of where my mouse is. The new, the new, this is the new um, thinking that I'm showing you, but the old, the old school making the cut further down the branch works uh, pretty well too. Okay, I guess I was supposed to use those arrows. There are two other type, types of cuts which we might use in, uh, that are really possible actually that we might use in pruning. One is um, a reduction cut. So this is kind of the inverse of the removal cut. We're removing a larger branch uh, and leaving the smaller branch. We use this a lot in structural pruning or, or it's really the only type of cut you can use to reduce the overall size of a canopy of a tree to like, keep it out of power lines or um, keep it away from a structure or something like that. Um, there is no collar involved here, right? So the potential for decay is much greater. They did studies in Florida with some maple trees where they made um, various types of reduction cuts and they were finding decay 30 feet down in some cases, I believe, from the cuts that they made uh, years later. So um, you wanna make sure that you're, when you're doing these that they're small cuts, you do them before the branches get too large, and we want to just be careful. The final type of pruning cut is one that we really just won't use when pruning trees. Um, it does have some niche specialty sort of things for tree pruning, um, but generally you just won't use on your trees, and it's a heading cut. So heading cut is where we cut back to, not to a union where two branches meet, but back to a bud, um, like you see in the picture here. Um, so what happens with the heading cut, it's a very like powerful pruning cut. We, we cut back to this bud, we remove the terminal bud, which means that the hormone the terminal bud was creating to suppress all these lateral buds from growing is now gone. And so all the lateral buds behind the cut here are going to become branches and you can get a witch's broom sort of thing going on there. Um, it can be lead to pretty undesirable structures. So we just try not to use it. You might occasionally need to use it with a long leggy branch. Um, that you know, on a on a very young tree, they use it in nursery production. But as a but dealing with trees at your home or or work, you really want to be careful when using it, and just generally don't. Uh, finally, when removing um, dead branches, the key with removing dead branches is um, one, they're dead, so you can always take them out. There's there's no um, they don't count against your pruning budget. You can always remove them. Uh, any time of year, it doesn't matter. But when we do it, we want to make sure that we cut just behind the, um, or just outside of the living tissue. You never want to cut into living tissue and removing dead wood. Better to leave a little dead wood and be like a little stub of dead wood and be safe than cut into the living tissue back here. So let's do this one more slide and then I will stop and answer some questions because I see some things, I can't see the chat, but I can see some things are being posted in it. So let me, um, let me do this one last slide and then I'll answer some questions. So the final kind of basics of pruning stuff revolves around the what's, when's, why. So when do we prune, what time of year, how much do we take off, and why might we want to be pruning? 
So in terms of the when, the very best time of year in our neck of the woods to prune is the early spring, right before the trees leaf out. Um, trees are in a pretty high energy state at this point. Um, they have all the stored energy from the previous year to close wounds and et cetera. They're also about to grow. So all the systems of growth that will close wounds are primed to go. Um, however, pruning any time during the growing season is, is absolutely fine. Um, we do wanna be careful about pruning late in the fall or in the dead of winter. Pruning late in the fall can lead to a flush of growth, which may not get time to harden off before we have a hard frost, especially think about the erratic weather we've had recently in the falls. Um, and then uh, the dead of winter is a dangerous time because the tree is dormant. And so the tree's defenses against decay and whatnot are not active. And if you make large pruning cuts um, during the dead of winter, sometimes you can get cracking as well. So generally the spring is the very best time. Anytime during the summer is fine. In terms of how much to prune, um, I said pruning is stressful. So we, the, you, before you even read those guidelines that are up here on the slide, um, know that you should be pruning as little as you can to achieve your objectives because pruning is stressful, right? The, the numbers I have up here are um, maximums um, if you needed to, um, but they're not like recommendations, if that makes sense. So for a young tree that's actively grow, so actually I'm step back. Generally, the rule of thumb is you start at a maximum of 25% of the, of the tree's foliage that could be removed. Um, and then you should round that up or down based on the age of the tree and the health of the tree. If the tree is young and healthy, you can round that number upwards. And if it's a young, like recently planted tree that's established, so it's, it's been planted a few years and it's started growing, um, you can prune up to much, as much as 50% of its canopy off if you need to um, per pruning, which essentially means per year. For in our neck of the woods, anyways. Um, for a medium aged tree, so a tree that's been in the landscape maybe, you know, 15 to 30 years in Colorado, um, you'd probably just want to do that 25% and just have that be your max. If the tree is older, um, so more mature, uh, which means essentially it's reached 75% of its expected mature height, that's what we call a mature tree, um, or it's in poor health, like it's under drought stress or it has a pest or, in, or some other, you know, issue. Um, we want to have a we want to we want to lower our max uh, drastically. Trees under drought stress really should not trees that are under drought stress really should not be pruned. Period. Um, if it's a mature tree, um, we want to set our maximum about twenty five percent. That's a, from a plant health perspective, twenty or ten percent max rather of a of a mature tree's canopy um, from a health perspective is our limit. However, in the real world, because having arborists come out is expensive, oftentimes even though we know it's not best for the tree more than that ends up being taken. So for young trees, this would be pretty much annually. For mature trees, it would really depend on the health um, of the tree and its issues. If it's a mature tree that has no issues, has good structure, not a lot of dead wood, it probably doesn't need to be pruned very often at all. Um, on the other hand, if it's a mature tree that's healthy but has like structural issues, you might wanna prune it more regularly. The tricky situation is if it's a mature tree that you're dealing with that is in poor health, and has a lot of other issues like poor structure. That's gonna be really tricky. You're gonna to wanna to get an arborist involved and have them do what's called restoration pruning, which will involve not only pruning, but also some um, mitigation of whatever's led to the poor health, increase in watering or something like that. So um, for young trees, which is what we're pretty much gonna focus on from here on out, we are pretty much pruning either to remove dead or broken branches, um, improve or really help set the tree's long-term structures, structure, and also to remove lower branches as they get larger and in our way, and we wanna limb up the tree, so to speak, so that we can, we can work and play under it easily. Um, and that's where we're going next. But I'm gonna close the PowerPoint real quick and take a look and see if you guys had any questions. Okay. I can chime in too, Eric, and read the questions to you if that's easier. Sure, go ahead. I'm, I'm looking at them, but if you want to read them, go for it. All right. We have one from Terry regarding evergreens, whether it's a good idea to prune the lower branches or to leave them because it helps the tree have a better structure with heavy snow. Okay. Yeah, that's a good question that we get. We get a lot, right? Um, 
uh, people hear various things about like limbing up blue spruce. Um, blue spruce are the, probably the most common, but it could also be other things like Austrian pines, et cetera. This would hold true for all of them. Um, they're so cute when they come from the nursery and they get planted too close to driveways and sidewalks and they get large and all of a sudden they're in the way. Um, so you want to be careful in limbing up evergreens. Uh, you can limb them up if you want to. Um, they'd prefer not to be limbed up, but you can if you want to. Just do it slowly. Don't raise them too rapidly. If you, if you, if you take them from ground, if you, you know, if you have a mature blue spruce that's 30 plus feet tall and it's branched all the way to the ground and in one year you lift it up seven to nine feet, you're going to really increase the risk the tree gets wind thrown. It's pushed over in a windstorm because you change the physics of how the tree responds to wind. I won't bore you with it, but that's the basics of it. Um, people oftentimes think it's because you create this umbrella and the wind gets underneath the tree. That's probably not true. It's more that you change the pivot points, and so it's more likely to fail in a windstorm if you raise it too rapidly. You can raise the trees uh, evergreen, uh, raise them slowly though, and they will kind of adapt um, over time to be able to you know, tolerate having their branches higher. So the short answer is trees would prefer to have, the, they'd prefer not to be limbed up, but if you need to do it, you can do it, just do it slowly. Hopefully that answers the question. And I, and I think that was the only one so far. Okay, and, I'll, and we can do a bunch of questions afterwards if people have them. So I will pop back into the PowerPoint then. Uh, share screen, PowerPoint. Okay, so um, we've kind of talked about what a good pruning cut is. We've talked a little about you know, the dangers of pruning and the benefits. And what we're gonna now do is talk about how we go about structurally pruning a tree. And I love this picture. It's so silly, but it's exactly, it's the perfect representation of structural pruning. Um, structural pruning is taking a tree that is having this big sunlight party in the landscape. It's got sun on all its lower branches and they're growing. It's having a carbohydrate party and telling it, no, tree, you are gonna look, you're gonna be well-behaved, you're gonna look more like your forest ancestors because that's the structure that's least likely to fail in my house or car or elsewhere in the landscape. So we refer to this pruning of young trees as structural pruning. Um, it's undertaken with trees that are in the early part of their life, the first one to 20-ish years. In Colorado, trees grow slower, so it might actually be up to 20 years. It can also be done on middle-aged trees, although by the time a tree reaches middle age, a lot of its structure is, um, already, uh, is already set in Colorado. Um, it's not for mature trees that are, you know, again, have reached most of their mature height. And it is the most important type of pruning that you can do to a tree because it is the only proactive pruning we do. It is pruning done to prevent long-term structural defects. So this ash tree in the picture here has um, really poor structure. It has three large stems, very low down. It's gonna be at a higher risk of failure. Obviously it's made it a long time and it hasn't failed, but it's all about like risk, right? So the risk that it fails is a little, is higher than a tree with good structure. And we can't do anything about that at this point. So structural pruning is something that would have been done early in this tree's life to prevent it having this sort that sort of structure. So to know, you know how to execute structural pruning, I guess we first have to define what good structure is. If this was a longer talk, I'd spend a lot more time on this, but we're just gonna do a very basic um, version of what good structure is. Good structure is a single dominant trunk to the top of the canopy. So both these trees have that, even though they have different shapes, they have a dominant trunk to very high up in the canopy. The, the lateral branches are smaller and subordinate to the dominant trunk. Um, in both examples. Um, and I, we'll talk about why that's important here in a second, but, but the, I guess the basics of it are that um, when, when you have branches of equal size, a collar is not formed and you're much, there's much more likely to be a failure there. There are also other problems that can arise with co-dominant or competing trunks. Um, we also like, would like to have strong branch unions. And so again, that would be branches that are, we want lateral branches that are half the size or less. So this is the lateral branch. This is the parent. We want the lateral, we want the lateral branch to be half the size or less of the parent because those create strong unions that have that overlapping tissue creating, um, which is in, you know, in the branch collar. So we might do pruning to slow down the growth of lateral branches to keep them small. Because again, they're getting a lot of sunlight in the landscape and they want to get big. 
We also want the branches to have wide angles. A, a, a wide branch angle is kind of counterintuitively stronger than a narrow one, which has to do with um, the branch being preloaded by gravity. A long horizontal, uh, a more horizontal branch, I should say, um, is more strongly acted upon by gravity. So it's always fighting gravity. So it's kind of like always in the gym working out. Um, and so it, it's kind of like stronger when um, a stress like wind or snow or something comes. And then finally, we want the branches to be well spaced. We want adequate distance between branches. Um, when branches are all clustered together, um, they like when there's snow or wind, a lot of stress is put to one spot on the trunk and the risk of failure is much higher. So we want our branches to be kind of well spaced, both, both uh, radially and then horizontally, um, or sorry, vertically along the stem. And then finally, we want to make sure that we have enough of our tree uh, as canopy. We don't, want too, we don't want too much of the tree to be bare trunk. Generally, the rule of thumb is we want 60% or two-thirds. I know those aren't the same thing, but that's always the way you hear it said. 60% or two-thirds of the tree to be canopy with only one-third or less being bare trunk. Uh, this just creates um, a trunk with better taper, so more like a trunk that will have better flare, like the end of a trumpet, um, which makes the trunk stronger and less likely to fail. Um, so we want to have a, a good ratio of live crown to dead trunk. So here's some examples in the real world. Um, here we have, uh, again, that ash, a large ash tree with poor structure on the left over here. Uh, nothing to be done about that anymore. It is what it is. Um, here we have a young tree, which actually died for other reasons, but you need to know that, um, <laughs> with poor structure. Codominant trunks, large lateral branches, narrow branch angles. Narrow branch angles have a lot of negatives to them that, again, if this is a longer talk, I'd explain why, but just trust me, they're bad. It can lead to included bark. And on this tree, we might be able to do something about it, right? Like pick a dominant leader and either remove or shorten, i.e. suppress the competing ones. So one we could help, one we couldn't. Here we have an example of a poor spacing of branches. This tree has bigger issues. It got hit by a trailer, but ignore that. The branches are poorly spaced. They're large. Um, pretty vertical, not desirable, probably can't do anything about it. Younger tree, honey locust on your right side here. Every branch in this tree appears to be the same size, right? And honey locusts want to do this oftentimes, certain varieties, especially they want to have this fan shape. So again, we could come in and either remove or suppress the competing limbs, so shorten them or remove them to uh, help there be one dominant leader and to slow the growth of these branches to keep them small and thus more strongly attached. Uh, here we have a really good example of what's really common with landscape trees. So this is a honey locust that's been pruned improperly for years. You can see many competing leaders. Um, you can see uh, large branches and you can see what I really took this picture for was how every branch in the tree comes back to this one point here where my mouse is. When the wind blows, all the force comes back to that one point. That means the tree is, that means there's much more likely to be a failure there i.e. a branch breaks under, ex under extreme stress. Um, this is an ash tree with a similar situation. One, two, three, four, five, and there was six branches all here at the same point. That's not desirable um, structure. On the other hand, here's an oak, which maybe is not perfect, but has better structure, right? You can see small lateral branches, right? Very horizontal. Maybe the spacing isn't perfect, but we could work on that a little bit. Um, so much better structure. And here's another oak, which has been pruned. Um, you can see small lateral branches, one dominant trunk to the top of the canopy. Branches are pretty well spaced. We'd want to start working on some of these areas where they're a little dense to pick ones that are going to stay and pick which ones are going to go. But this is a great picture because you can see at the ends of all these branches what's happening. The, they're all growing vertically because there's not that competition they would have in a forest. They're getting a lot of sunlight and they're growing towards that sunlight. So, every, so occasionally these are gonna have to be suppressed to keep them subordinate to the dominant leader. Structural pruning is an ongoing thing. You have to keep coming back at it year after year after year. Um, so you can think of structural pruning as really managing the growth rate of branches. Um, and, and maybe Cassie can chime in. Were there any questions about structure to answer at this point. I saw a couple of things ping in the chat. I haven't had a question about structure, but one about fruit tree pruning. Okay. If you guys want to talk fruit trees, we can do it after the class. Um, 
it's a this it's a whole different talk. It's another hour long talk, and we could we could set up a talk on that too while everyone's staying at home, quarantined here at some point. But it's a whole hour long talk with a whole different set of objectives that are more about promoting fruit growth than strong structure. Now you care about structure to some extent, but they're more about promoting fruit growth. And if anyone has any individual questions, I'm happy to stick around after the talk and either chat with you and chat about it, or you can unmute your mic and we can talk about it, or you can give me a call or email me. Um, but I don't have time probably to get too much into it other than that. So sorry about that, but we'll, we can try to get a talk on it um, here maybe the next couple of weeks. So. One more question. What should I do about vertical branches coming from major branches? So sucker growth, it sounds like. Yeah, right. So that's a hard question to answer without seeing the tree, but um, if the branch that the vertical growth is coming from is permanent, meaning you envision it being on the tree for the life of the tree, you're probably going to want to remove those vertical branches as long as they're small, like sucker growth, like in less than a, you know, two inches in diameter, you probably just want to remove them. Um, alternately, um, you know, on the other hand, you don't want to remove all the, all the, in, all the um, branches in the in interior part of the canopy. So if it's sucker growth, you probably want to be removing it or at least thinning them, removing them. So they're, you know, there's only one branch spaced every, um, you know, three ish feet along the branch, depending on the tree type. Um, if it's not sucker growth, if it's just branches growing in the interior of the canopy of a larger tree, you want to, you know, you can thin those, but you want to leave some interior branches. Um, so there's leaves in the interior of the canopy to be doing some photosynthesis to provide energy to those branches to grow in diameter and stay strong. So hopefully that answers the question. If it doesn't, we can, we can chat more about it as we go, as we get to the end of the talk. And that's all I've got in at the moment. Okay, so since there um, aren't other questions, um, I will forge ahead with talking about how we go about doing the structural pruning. Um, so when I was learning structural pruning, the thought that really just made it click in my head um, was when I started to think about it as managing the growth rate of branches. Um, some branches we want to encourage them to uh, keep growing like the the dominant lead, the central leader of the tree. We want to make sure that it's getting sunlight. Uh, it has leaves. It can grow, so it grows rapidly. Other branches we want to we want to we want to slow their growth rate, or in some cases remove them. So, um, if, a, if there's a large lateral branch, we want to take leaves off of it. I take you know leaves and wood off of it, so it has less leaves and does less photosynthesis, and its growth rate is um, is then slowed. So over time that relatively large lateral branch will get relatively smaller. It won't shrink, but it'll grow less than the main trunk will. Um, so if you, if you think about think about it that way, I think it helps. So for example, for this, this tree here, we've got a, quite a few structural problems. We have codominant stems here. This one and this one are also probably competing. We've got large lateral branches. We maybe have some poorly spaced branches. And how much we care about the poorly spaced branches probably depends on how big this tree is. I don't give you a scale. If it was a very small tree just from the nursery, we don't care about the spacing nearly as much as a larger tree where the branches are ones that are maybe going to be on the tree forever. They're permanent, they're a higher height. So we have some poorly spaced branches as well. So, so we, we see this competing leaders, right? So we could easily deal with that by removing one. Now, you know, we definitely slowed this branch's growth because we took it off, right? We got more competing leaders up here. And actually, in some ways, this is the easiest one to deal with. And it's the one you should most want to deal with because it's the smallest cut and it prevents a larger long-term problem with just a little snip. Um, we have other, um, we got, you know, these issues with these large lateral branches down here. So in this case, say we want to slow the growth of this. We make a, a reduction cut back to this branch. We've taken off maybe, who knows, 50% of the leaves or something. And so we're drastically going to reduce the growth rate of that branch over time. Same thing over here. So let's look at some options we could do. We could prune back to that. We could prune back there. That probably doesn't take off enough to solve the issue. If we come back to there, um, now we've taken off a lot of leaves and we're really going to slow the growth rate of that branch. Same thing up top in the tree. 
we, this is kind of competing. We could do a reduction cut to slow it, um, et cetera. So I've kind of shown you the cuts. I might even have done more cuts on this tree in the real world, um, but I've kind of shown you some of the cuts, you know, some of the basic ideas here um, of structural printing. And when you, when you look at it on paper, I, I oftentimes feel like it seems a lot simpler than it is in the real world where a tree has three dimensions. Um, so I think the best way to approach it is to, is to walk up to the tree with a set of priorities in mind to like decide which of these cuts you're going to do. Because if you look at them, we've maybe taken out 33%, 40% of the tree, uh, the tree's foliage already. So even though there are other structural issues, like these branches that are pretty vertical, uh, maybe competing with the leader a little bit, or will be one day, we maybe we can't do them all in, in one year because we can only print so much. So if you have like a, a set of priorities in mind when you set when you walk out to the tree, it makes it a little easier to decide where to prune and when. And that's kind of what I'm gonna walk you through here. So our first priority, the first strategy that we're gonna use when we prune, uh, and the and the most important one is we're gonna wanna develop um, and then maintain a strong central leader by either removing or shortening the um, uh, competing branches and upright stems. And so that's the stuff in the blue bubble, right? We either removed or shortened competing branches um, to, to, so, the, so that the central leader, the one that we pick, can, you know, will be the dominant one over time. And I should point out too here that I picked this little one on the left. You could have easily picked this one on the right. That would have been, for all intents and purposes, pretty much the same thing. So sometimes you have two choices which are within 5% of being, you know, they're very similar and it's best just to pick one and do one, um, you know, and not kind of be um, paralyzed by like, am I making the right choice? Because ultimately, as long as you pick one, it's gonna be better than had you done nothing. So I've seen a lot of um, pinging in the chat. Are there some questions that maybe we should answer now? One, per, uh, one person asked how the, these cuts are different than heading cuts. Um, I did give them a brief answer, but if you wanted to give more of an answer. Sure. So like um, the, the, curse, the cut that my um, mouse is over here is not a heading cut because it came back to a branch, right? If I'd made it just in the middle, it would have been a heading cut. Um, and thus had a lot more potential to like release all the lateral buds. Does that make sense, hopefully? Yeah, that's pretty much what I said as well. Um, the next question is, how do you apply these principles to weeping or columnar trees? Those are two different questions, I just merged them. Sure. So they all apply um, to columnar trees, that's the easy answer, let's talk about that first. So to columnar trees, they all are going to apply just like I, I speak them. Um, some of the really upright trees want to have a lot of upright branches. And even though they want to do that, they want to have all their these upright stems that are very tightly packed together. Um, you don't want to let them do that. You want to be shortening those upright stems so other branches along the trunk have a chance to grow. So they still stay upright, but they have branches coming out all along their trunk instead of just all coming from like three or four major branches at the bottom. So for columnar trees, they apply just just like I teach them. Um, and weeping trees are really different. Um, weeping trees are mostly just gonna be at a higher risk of failure for, for most of their life. Um, you, you, still wanna, you still wanna try to have a central leader, but you're gonna tend to have longer lateral branches that are more prone to failure. Um, so you're still gonna wanna be like taking off leaves to keep the lateral branches small where you can, and when possible, you want to be selecting a central leader, especially if it's like a large weeping tree, like a, I'm trying to think of one, like a camper down elm. Um, a lot of weeping trees, though, are more ornamental trees. They're weeping crab apples, weeping cherries. And because those aren't going to get so large, we don't care as much about the structure, and we kind of just let them have the structure they're going to have. We still might do some pruning, like I said, to keep lateral branches small and maybe try to space them a bit. But because they're never going to get as large, as um, a shade tree, we don't care as much. Now, if you're dealing with like a weeping um, uh, willow, um, that's just gonna be a mess. It's gonna be very hard to train that into a good structure. So essentially just do your best you can to keep the lateral branches small and when possible have a central leader, but you're just, it's gonna be a struggle. I don't have, you know, they're just, they're messy trees, they're prone to failure anyways, and they just don't have very good structure. 
And if you prune them too severely, they won't look very, they won't have that weeping habit you're, you're looking for. So you just have to kind of accept they're at a higher risk of failure, which is depressing, but kind of the way it is, so. And I'm gonna assume, was there another question, Cassie? No, nope, that's it. Okay. Okay, so let's talk about um, real quick, and I'm, I find I'm talking faster and faster as I go on, so I'm gonna to try to calm down, guys. I'm just so excited. Um, let's talk about um, uh, some of the other structural pruning strategies. So this, the, the first one is the most important, and, and after you remove anything that's dead or broken, the first thing you should spend your pruning budget on. You know, if you decide you're going to remove 30% of a tree's canopy max, you kind of spend that 30% first at, at selecting leader and suppressing um, codominant or removing codominant stems. Uh, a brief note, um, pruning has like all this very specialized language and it's very strong controlling language. Um, and I use them kind of interchangeably and so do a lot of people. But just to be clear, suppression is removing um, removing part of a branch to slow its growth, which then subordinates it to the dominant leader. That's what those terms test technically mean, but um, anyways, they get used kind of interchangeably. So the second strategy actually isn't, doesn't involve any pruning. The second thing you should do after you've, you know, selected a leader and removed or shortened the other ones is you need to pick the branch on the tree that is going to, the lowest branch um, which will be on the tree for its entire life. So in a landscape setting, that's usually a branch somewhere between, you know, um, nine and 13 feet from the ground. If it's over a street, it's probably 13 feet. If it's over a driveway or something like that, it's probably nine. If a tree is just in a yard and maybe you want lower branches for whatever reasons, because you like them, you can obviously, you can pick a lower branch to be the first branch that'll be on the tree forever. Um, it doesn't matter. It's going to be situationally um, dependent. But you, you do need to pick which branch is the first branch that will stay because we manage the, the temporary branches that are below it, below that permanent branch differently than we manage the uh, mix of temporary and permanent branches that'll be above it. Hopefully that makes sense. This is a part in the talk where people sometimes get lost and normally I'm in a room and I can see your faces. So hopefully that, but I can't. So hopefully that makes sense to everybody. Um, a hard thing to wrap your mind around is that a young tree that you bring home from the nursery that's say six to eight feet tall, no branch, no lateral branch on that tree is probably gonna be on that tree in 15 or 20 years. They are all temporary. Uh, you know, they're all gonna be taken off as the tree gets taller. And so we're gonna treat them differently than we do permanent branches. So here's a little illustration of a tree over time. This is probably not in Colorado. This is probably some place where things grow faster. But for a, for a young tree, as we see on the left here, all branches, you know, are maybe temporary. They're all going to come off except for the sun, the leader or the uh, the main trunk over time slowly. For a middle-aged tree, we have a mix of temporary branches and then we have the permanent canopy above that where there'll be a mix of temporary and permanent branches. And then eventually we get to the point where the tree has reached a size where all the temporary branches outside of the permanent canopy are removed. And we start having this, these scaffold, these permanent scaffold branches that are evenly spaced in the canopy. And you'll notice up at the top, we have a mix of the permanent scaffold branches with some small branches in between it, in between them, which are temporary and probably gonna be removed at some point as the tree gets even taller. So it's really important to you know, to start thinking about the long-term structure of the tree, even at a young age. And the next strategy is kind of like take that um, idea and turn it into actual pruning. So once we've picked that first permanent branch, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna make sure that we prevent branches that are below the permanent crown from growing too large in diameter, or um, relative size. We call that aspect ratio. Relative size compared to the parent branch. So essentially we want them to stay smaller than four inches at the largest because we don't want them to develop heartwood because we want, so we want them um, because heartwood is risky to expose if the branch is removed. So we want them to, we want to slow their growth to keep them shorter than that and eventually remove them before the, or sorry, smaller than that and eventually remove them before they get to uh, four inches in size. Um, and we also want them to stay less than half the size of, the of their parent branch so they have a collar. 
so that when we remove them, we don't create an undue risk of decay getting into the main stem, okay? So the blue circles are probably our circles that may um, align with this strategy. So we're shortening this branch. This branch is getting a little large, so we're removing a bunch of it to slow its growth so that it'll stay small in both diameter and uh, its relative size compared to its parent branch. And the same thing over here. We're then gonna manage the, uh, all the other branches of the tree. Uh, and we wanna keep them, um, we wanna keep all the, we, you know, we wanna keep all the branches in the tree uh, relatively small compared to the parent branches because we want all the branches to have collars, which are strong. So we're going to um, do pruning to slow the growth of rapidly growing branches in the permanent canopy to make sure that they are small and develop a collar. Um, so, but I guess before I go on, just real quick, I don't want to spend too much time on this. If a branch is permanent, like we think it's going to be on the tree forever, it's well spaced, et cetera. Um, we don't, we don't ever want to, we still don't want to ever let it get larger than half the size, than about half the size of the branch it originates from, than its parents branch, because we want to have a collar. However, it, again, for a permanent branch, we don't care about its absolute size. It can get bigger than four inches because it's never coming off. So we're never hypothetically are going to be exposing um, the heartwood that will develop within it, right? For temporary branches that are either low in the canopy or they're poorly spaced branches up in the canopy that'll one day be coming off, we want to keep them both small um, in relative size, half the size of their parent branch, so they get that collar because a collar keeps decay out when we remove the branch. And we want to keep them less than four inches in absolute size because in diameter, because we don't want to expose heartwood and make the cut. So that's a pretty critical thing. Hopefully it makes sense. So speaking of branch spacing, if we still have pruning, if we still have pruning budget left at this point, after, doing the, after going through the other four strategies, we're gonna start working on spacing. We're gonna look up in the canopy above the first permanent branch and try to pick branches that are well spaced essentially with 5% of, of the trees expected mature height between them. So if the tree is gonna be 100 feet tall, we want five feet between permanent branches. If it's gonna be 50 feet tall, we want two and a half feet between permanent branches and so forth. So we'll pick the permanent branches and we'll manage them like permanent branches. We'll keep them relatively small compared to the trunk, but we don't care about how big they are in absolute size. And the branches between those permanent ones will then manage as temporary branches. We'll keep them small in absolute size and relative size, and we'll remove them before they get bigger than four inches, ideally bigger than two inches. This is important in the permanent canopy, and that's a hard thing to wrap your mind around. If, if the tree has no permanent canopy, the spacing of the branches is not very important. And it's a thing people oftentimes get caught up on on really young trees. They have an eight foot tree, right? And no branch in that tree is gonna be there in 15 years, but people are still very worried about how they're spaced. It's just not that important, right? They're coming off eventually, so we don't care on a really young tree. Now, if aesthetically you want to try to balance the tree when it's smaller, you know, whatnot, that's fine. But it's not super important um, for the long-term health of the tree uh, to worry about spacing uh, on a very young tree. So finally, uh, if we have um, any pruning budget left, we're going to do a couple other things with it. We're going to deal with obvious structural defects that we see. And so here we have picture of pictures of included bark. Um, so when I say included bark, what I mean is that literally bark isn't included in the union. So all three of these pictures have included bark. Probably the easiest one to see included bark on is this split picture over on the right. Um, so on the left of that picture right here, you see a normal union. There is not overlapping wood here uh, for whatever reason, but there is wood connected to wood, uh, touching and connected. So there's strength here. On the right side, you can see that the bark of the two branches got kind of pinched and included in the union. So this is just bark on bark, no connection, no strength. The only strength in this union holding it up is the wood down here, much, much weaker, more prone to failure. When, when the branch, when a branch is not split, you can see this kind of two ways. One, you can see the tree trying to grow over the inclusion, creating these kind of elephant ears. So those would be, there's an inclusion between these two branches and the tree is trying to grow it over. But every time the wind blows, you know, they kind of separate and it creates wounding and you get this mounding of callus tissue. You can also look for a, like on the far left picture for bark that is rolled into the union. 
So here's like a normal sort of furrow. Here you can see it's kind of rolled in smoothly. So this is just bark on bark here, no structural, no strength. The only strength is the connection between the wood down here, much more prone to failure. So the way we would deal with that is either by removing the bark, the branch here, or shortening it to take weight off of it so it's less likely to fail. So if we have pruning budget left, we might deal with these obvious structural defects with it, like, for example, bark inclusions. And then we want to make sure that we are also um, with our, this is a kind of a tricky objective because sometimes you have to prioritize this a little higher, um, but we want to make sure that we're raising the tree over time and getting, getting rid of those lower branches, those lower temporary branches before they get too large. So again, from Dr. Gilman's tech, textbook, we have um, some pictures here. This is a, a tree, and then there are three ways to deal with it. This way, um, the top right um, illustration is obviously incorrect. You've raised it much too far too fast. That tree is going to be placed under stress, and it's going to not form proper like tapering of the trunk. It won't have that trumpet-like taper on the trunk. Uh, be much more prone to failure. Both of the lower two versions are acceptable. In this version, they've just removed the larger lower branches and left these little small ones. So there's still some leaves to provide energy to the main trunk down here, but over time, they'll probably come off too. On, the, on this lower image, on the lower, uh, the lower right image, you can see uh, they've just shortened those major branches. And so what they've done here by not removing, the reason, the reason you might want to shorten them opposed to um, remove them might have to do with their absolute size. So if these branches are already eight inches, it might be better just to shorten them um, rather than remove them and make a large pruning wound that could lead to the K getting into the tree. If they're all small, probably just, uh, if they're all four inches or less, probably just get them off before they get any bigger. And so again, you want to do this gradually over time, keeping at least two thirds of the tree or 60%, which again, I know is not the same thing, um, canopy with a one third bare trunk. And so sometimes um, if your lower branches are like already approaching four inches, you have to prioritize removing them over like managing some other, um, managing um, temporary branches in the permanent canopy or things like that. You might have to like move this up the priority list, even though it's seven in some cases, especially if the tree has not been pruned for a long time, just to get those branches, those lower branches off before they get too big. So there's a last cut. So hopefully um, I haven't seen any questions pinging. So I'm just going to keep going. Um, hopefully that all makes sense. If it doesn't, we can add, we can do a bunch of questions at the end. There are two other things I want to talk about. Um, one is common mistakes to avoid, and then we'll talk a little about tools for pruning trees. So um, one thing you really want to avoid, and it's super common. I've done this to trees, both in my professional and uh, private life is only removing the downward or inward growing branches on, on the, of the tree, particularly on the lower branches. So you can see example of what happens, and it's real common, right? There's some lower branches that are like in a sidewalk or driveway, and so you prune them off just to get them out of the way. And then the next year, there are some more, there are some new downward growing branches and the new growth, and we remove those to keep it clear. What happens over time, if that's all you do, is that these lower branches get larger and larger, and every year removing the lower, you know, the downward growing growth, but leaving the branch, they get larger and larger, and eventually they get too large to safely remove. So instead of, um, instead of that, what, what we should do is, you know, suppress that branch to keep it small and then remove the whole branch to get it out of the way, right? If it's too low, you know, for, if we don't plan on being part of the permanent canopy, the whole branch should come off, just not the um, downward uh, growing branches coming off of it. Um, so, so that said, uh, let's just look at a couple examples of trees and how we fix it. So normally we do this kind of as an exercise, but because we're all digital, I'm just going to leave it up here and give you maybe 30 seconds to think about it. We have three trees. The middle tree already has good structure. The two outside trees have poor structure. Maybe you can kind of on your, on your own individual screen, just think about it for maybe 30 seconds, you know, where you would prune, keeping in mind those strategies we just talked about. The most important one being to select a permanent leader and suppress or shorten the competing leaders. Also keeping in mind, you know, you might have a pruning budget. So I'll just give you a very brief second to, to look at those and kind of think about it. And then I'll show you where I would have, um, where I would have pruned. So, 
So I'm going to, I'm going to do the big reveal. I'm going to show you, you know, kind of what I would have done. Uh, and I'm going to show you assuming I had a limited pruning budget. Okay. So assuming I could prune as much as I wanted to, um, which is not a real world situation, but so there you can see the cuts, um, suppress, suppress, remove, suppress, suppress. These, these lateral branches are a little large and probably this one is even maybe competing with the leader. So we wanna slow down their growth rate. Here we're getting rid of a competing limb that's also probably a little large or suppressing it rather, not getting rid of it. And here we're removing a co-dominant leader. Um, removing a co-dominant leader, uh, suppressing a co-dominant leader, um, suppressing another codominant leader. Um, I chose to remove this whole branch just because of spacing and I was not left with a lot of good pruning options to shorten it. So in this case, I just decided to take it all the way off and then here suppress. And so that's what they would look like afterwards. So, you know, the question then is, is what I did reasonable here? On the left tree, I maybe took off 30-ish percent. It's always hard in the real world. I find that people either are very good, people are very bad at estimating how many, how much they've taken off. Either we want to estimate way much, way too much. We cut off one branch and look at it and be like, that was 30%, I'm done. Or on the other hand, we cut off like, you know, three quarters of the tree and look at it and think, ah, that wasn't, you know, that, uh, about half or something. So it can be kind of difficult in the real world. But I think on the paper here, about 30% for the left-hand tree and maybe 50 ish percent on the right hand tree. So both of those might have been okay um, if the trees were young, vigorous, and actively growing. Here's just one more example. So this tree has large lateral branches here. Even this one's a little large, approaching half the size. Poorly spaced branches, competing, um, competing leaders here, here, and then here. Even this may be even these two may be competing. And then again, this is a vertical branch. So again, assuming a limited pruning budget, um, this was um, what I chose to do. Um, removed some of the competing branch branches, shortened other ones, um, got rid of this funky branch altogether because of spacing issues. A little larger tree hypothetically here, so we're starting to worry about spacing. In that case, I probably took 50%. That may have been more than I could have done in one year. I find the branch that always rubs people wrong um, that I didn't print off is this one here that's kind of hanging down. Um, not to say I particularly like that branch, but it was a lower priority get priority getting rid of it than getting rid of all these competing branches and, and uh, slowing down the growth rate of some of these large lateral branches. So maybe in a future year I do address that, but it just wasn't a priority for me. Aesthetically, it may not be great, but from a structural perspective, um, it's not really causing any harm. So. Hope that makes sense. Um, a couple of the things that we just don't want to do, uh, we don't want to top trees. I'll show you just the picture. This is some topped you know, trees. This used to be real common practice where they would treat a tree like a hedge and kind of shear it. Very bad for a tree for a number of reasons. Don't have this done to your trees. Don't let your neighbors do it to their trees. If an arborist suggests doing this, politely tell them you're going to seek a different arborist. It's just not good practice. Um, I have to be careful because I'll go on and on about it, but just trust me, it's it's bad practice. And we've gotten, arborists have gotten a lot better not, not promoting this. The other thing we don't want to do is lion's tail a tree. So this is where you remove all the inward and downward growing branches and just essentially leave a little poof of foliage, like the poof at the end of a lion's tail. Very bad for a tree, um, changes the pivot point. Now when the wind blows, all the force is coming to the middle of these branches instead of somewhere down here much more prone to failure, um, took way over 50% of, tre of the tree's canopy, so very stressful. We don't want to do this. Oftentimes this was sold to people as like a um, thing that had to be done to their trees before a storm or something to prevent them from failing in the storm. All this does is make the tree more likely to fail, so we don't, we don't want to be doing it. So here, um, if you're screenshotting stuff, this is kind of my, um, my summary. This is like the little, if we were in face-to-face, -face, I'd give this to you as a handout. This is kind of my little summary of, like this was the card I would take with me out when I would do pruning. So this is how I would, how I would order my objectives, um, how I'd organize my pruning to make sure I met my objectives and didn't prune too much. We're gonna remove branches that are dead, damage, or rubbing. We always do that. After that, we, sel we select a leader or move or shorten competing branches. We pick our lowest permanent branch. We then manage potential permanent branches to keep them half the size of their parents or less. 
we manage temporary branches to um, keep them smaller than half the size of their parent and to remove them before they get to bigger than two to four inches. Maybe we keep them small or waiting to remove them. So that's my little cheat sheet that I would I'd bring out into the, the yard with me if I was doing pruning. So very brief note on mature trees. I didn't talk about this. Um, at the end of the talk, which we're pretty much there, I'm gonna ask you guys in chat to put um, topics you might be interested in having talks on, not saying we won't be able to, we'll be able to do them all, but while we're all working from home, we have the potential to do some webinars like this. So if you wanna put suggestions for talks into the chat, that's fine. We're already thinking about pruning shrubs. That might be one that shows up here in the next few weeks. Um, but very briefly, on pruning mature trees, they're, they're very much less tolerant of pruning than young trees. So we wanna prune them um, much more carefully, 10% of the foliage maximum or less. Um, and so the, you know, that's the big thing. And, and really the, the short, the big answer for mature trees, if you're dealing with a large tree like the cottonwood here, you need, even though it is expensive, to get a certified arborist involved. And you know, if you do a lot of structural pruning on a young tree, by the time it gets mature, it'll need much less pruning than an unpruned tree. So for mature trees, you really just need to call a certified arborist. The best way to find them, two ways. You can look up the Rocky Mountain Society of International Society of the Rocky Mountain chapter, I should say, of the International Society for Arboriculture online, and they have a directory of arborists. Or you can call your local city forester, and he or she can direct you to arborists that are certified to work with within your municip your municipality. That's oftentimes the very best way to find a local arborist is to talk to your city forester. Um, and I'm going to, I'm going to leave it there for, for mature trees. Um, generally the most type, common type of pruning they need is cleaning. So just removing dead, broken branches, removing suckers, removing diseased branches. That's really what most mature trees need. Um, thinning is oftentimes something people want to do to mature trees. So they want to take out branches to make the canopy thinner. So light penetrates into the canopy and wind moves through the canopy. Um, but the benefits of thinning are really short-lived because right after you prune, the tree immediately starts growing again. Um, so really thinning is only recommended for trees that are at increased risk for failure because they, you know they have decay or they're planted in a, like a area with limited rooting area, like a tree coffin, like you see downtown, those tree planters downtown. But otherwise thinning is maybe a little more controversial than it used to be. And most trees don't need to be routinely thin unless they have a disease, a foliar disease issue, or you know there's decay in the canopy, or it's in a really windy site. So I'm gonna wrap up very briefly with some talk, with a, with a talk about tools. Um, I have this little- We are after one o'clock, by the way. Okay, and I've got one slide. So I'm gonna, this is, uh, I'll put up my content information. Essentially, all I wanna tell you about tools is that for most people at home, I don't think you need to be using a chainsaw unless you're doing a whole lot of pruning. It's a very dangerous tool. And there are a lot of other really good tools out there. Generally, you want to be using bypass pruners, and uh, which is this style here instead of this hammer type here. Bypass pruners make a much uh, better cut. They don't pinch. Um, spend the extra 10 bucks to get a good pair from one of the companies that makes better pruners, Corona, AM Leonard, um, or one of several other ones. Um, my other favorite tool for pruning trees is a razor saw, which you can now get at the Home Depot or Lowe's or any of the big box stores. Um, they're very sharp. They don't require you to be particularly strong. They just they go the main motion you make is a back and forth motion when cutting with them. You don't have to push down. So if the branch is less than about uh, three quarters, half an inch, I'm going to use pruners. If it's larger than that, I'm going to use a razor saw. And again, chainsaws are just so I don't use them unless it's uh, I'm doing a bunch of pruning because it's just it's the, it's probably the most dangerous tool you own. If you're pruning above your head. Um, please don't do that from a ladder. Please don't prune large branches from a ladder. That's very dangerous. Small branches like in this tree, that's fine. You want to get a pull pruner, a pull saw, or this one has a saw and a pruner when you pull the cord. And again, there's a huge difference in quality with those. So I know I went about uh, three to five minutes long. Um, we wanted to keep this about an hour because that's about anyone can stand sitting in front of their computer. Um, here you have some resources that if you're really into pruning, you can go to our garden note. I linked that in the chat earlier. The very best book on pruning for young trees that I've ever found is Dr. Gilman's Guide to Pruning, which is um, pictured here. You can find it on Amazon for about 60 bucks. It's, it's a great guide. Um, and again, I'm gonna type my contact information here into the PowerPoint for you. I either wasn't here, but you can email me if you've got questions at ehammond at adcogov.org if you need to get a hold of me. Um, 
I'm, I'm working from home, so all I have to time to do is answer emails. So if you, have, if you have bigger questions you want to talk to me about or send me pictures, you can do it that way. Um, and if you, if you need to leave, thank you for joining us um, so much. I'm going to post a brief um, 